<laughs> this really isn't this afternoon anything about Robin Burns. This is a reflection of friendships and acknowledgments. I want to start off by saying I hope that you like what I wore this afternoon. My wife Kate and I live in Orlando. We are senior citizens and normally we get the four o'clock early bird special. <laughs> and I wear the plaid shorts, the striped shirts, the tube socks, canvas shoes, and from my grandson, the hat that says, Papa loves his golfing. <laughs> this is actually my second Hall of Fame, at least according to myself. My wife, on the other hand, thinks this is only my first because she has accused me of bribing the other committee to let me get into that first Hall of Fame. It's funny how this industry comes full circle. You know, we're talking about Hi Ho Silver Heels, and I do want to thank him passionately for letting me have some of his air time here this afternoon. Jay Silver Heels, who was the horse that was named after, goes back to the early and mid 1970s. Mylon and Myrna Smith and Jay Silver Heels, they were all members of the same tribe. Gary Buxton and I got Jay Silverheels license to have his first parimutuel drive at Louisville Downs. Finished third that night and celebrated with us by having a scotch and ginger ale at the Holiday Inn in Louisville, Kentucky. Time now for the obligatory thank yous. I want to thank my parents, obviously, my wife, Kate, but I have to throw my brother in there as well. He is not able to travel these days. He would have loved to have been here this afternoon, but he just couldn't do it. But he is, through his enthusiasm, thanks all of you for your support this afternoon. I have to thank the chair, Robin Clemens, <coughs> the other members of the uh, committee who unanimously voted me in to the CHHA Hall of Fame. Not that I was counting or anything, but I think I'm the 21st person to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> People often ask me, well, how did you get into the horse racing industry? How did you begin to call? And I tell them that I had a golf scholarship to the University of Miami that I really didn't take advantage of. So I came back home to Niagara Falls and my parents, unfortunately, at the time, were going through a divorce. They were getting divorced on account of illness. They were sick of each other. <laughs> <laughs> so right about that time, my mother said to me, Robin, you have become a total degenerate. All you do is you play cards for money, you play golf for money, you bowl for money. You go to the thoroughbreds during the day, and you go to the harness at night. Now, why would she ever call me a degenerate? I thought I was a well-rounded young man. <laughs> so because I was going to the track all the time, she says, okay, you have three months to get a job, or else you have to get off the couch. So my dad picks me up to go play golf one day, and there were a lot of tracks where I lived. On the American side, there was Buffalo Raceway and Batavia Downs. On the Canadian side, there was Mohawk, there was Greenwood, there was Woodbine, there was Garden City in St. Catharines, and I frequented all of them. So I began to dabble in calling races. I would take the uh, newspaper, the Buffalo uh, Evening News. I would cut out all the horses, throw them into a hat, go to my favorite bar, charge everybody $5, and I would call a race. So there was $40 in the pot, eight horses in each race, 25 for the winner, $10 for second, $5 for myself. I think that adds up to 40. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so I would call the race, and you know, $50 a night, not bad for a kid in 1972 or 73. So I said, Dad, I said, I'm going to take a shot. I said, you know, these guys like the way that I call the races in the bar. So I called Gaston Valley Cat, really my first mentor at Buffalo. I said, Mr. Valley Cat, my name is Robin Burns. 
I said, I want to become a track announcer. I said, I have a couple of tapes. Would you be interested in hearing them? And he goes, no. I said, come on. I said, the style that I have is a little bit different than what you are normally used to. I said, you know, just give me a shot. So he goes, okay, you can come up here with a, your cassette tape. And he's rolling makeup calls. And he goes, uh, I'll listen to them. So he had about five or six of his associates in his office that day. Played the tape. He sent everybody out. He goes, you can start on Saturday night. And he let me call a race a night. So about 30 days later, he calls me and he goes, you have a car? And I said, no. I said, why? Do you want to play golf? <laughs> he says, no, you silly son of a bitch. I work for a living. So he goes, can you be in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania tomorrow morning and call a qualifier? So this is kind of like the defining moment in my life. So my friend and I drive all the way down to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and I'm going to have a call-off against another gentleman who was the backup at Brandywine to the legendary Roy Shutt. So he called the odds, and I called the even races. And he put his binoculars up, and this man was shaking like this. And I look at my friend Dave Johnson, I says, Dave, I said, you know, I'm nervous. I said, I'm not that nervous. So we call the races, went downstairs. General manager calls Joe Iannuzzi and Joe comes out. He goes, congratulations, you got the job. So I had called races rip literally for 30 days. I went from Buffalo to Pocono to Wheeling Downs to Louisville Downs, where I met Ed Keller, Hall of Famer, who really took me under his wing and just taught me so, so much. Thank you, Ed. To Hollywood Park in literally about nine months. I had the biggest job in the country. I went from a degenerate to actually, I think, you know, be, being something. I want to thank Gary Buxton. I want to thank Press Genuine, another member of the Hall of Fame here. Um, Roy Shutt who had a lifetime contract at Brandywine that whenever Brandywine was open, that he had to be there. It was an a, enormous accomplishment. Opening night, 1974, Gladys Knight and the Pips were there to open up. Opening weekend, 24,000, 26,000, 25,000 on track. Like Jimmy said, the apron was absolutely packed. Came up to uh, Cal Expo. Summertime, the announce booth here is absolutely pathetic. <laughs> you have the beetles that would fly into you during the middle of a race call. They came in like they were Cape Buffalo. <laughs> so finally I said, got to do something about this. So they let me call from the turf club, down amongst the masses. So one Friday, we had um, a girl from Max's Opera Cafe come over. Irish girl, nice girl, Siobhan O'Hara. So I'm sitting there and I'm ready to get up and call the uh, girl to do the um, national anthem. There was this guy who was absolutely trashed behind me. Ladies and gentlemen, would you now please stand for the singing of the national anthem by Miss Siobhan O'Hara. All of a sudden, this guy behind me yells, Siobhan O'Hara sucks! <laughs> and I said, nevertheless, she will sing. <laughs> From there, Went to Hong Kong after we had that fledgling meeting at Del Mar. I guess they put Del Mar would do nowadays on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon when there was just virtually no product to go against them. Transitioned over to during the thoroughbreds at Maryland. I called all the tracks in Maryland, Laurel, Pimlico, Free State, Rosecroft. Ended up going to TVG out of that. So they knew that I was on a really limited time frame because I was at Scioto Downs and I was kind of like the Indianapolis Colts. I flew out of there under the cover of night. Go out there, met with a couple people. 
And they said, Robin, what are you doing up? I'm simulcast director and announcer at Scioto Downs. Well, here, tell us a little bit about your duties. And I just went through literally the entire week of schedule. And they said, just give us a second. So I said, all right. So now I've done the thoroughbreds. I've done the start, the knee harness. They came back out and they said, listen, we are going to offer you this job. And I said, wow, I said, that is fantastic. And they said, the only reason that we're giving you this job is that you go both ways. And I said, I do the harness and I do the thoroughbreds. So they, they hired me. Gary Seibel, another constituent of mine from TVG. We both had the uh, secret handshake in the back office for a while, but we have moved on to bigger and better things. Just about done. Still going strong, calling thoroughbred races at Presque Isle Downs in Erie, PA after a 10 year hiatus. I tell people that there will be no more of a farewell tour for Robin Burns, because right now it takes me three minutes or so to memorize the 12 horse field. When it takes me 12 minutes to memorize a three horse field, that's when I'm going to go ahead and call it a night. I would be remiss if I didn't talk just for a second about some people who were great friends, not only of myself, but for great friends of California harness racing. Shelly Goodrow, who tragically passed away that night when the line broke on Reagan's lad and literally was dead when he hit the ground, would have been one of the greatest drivers of all time, no question. His drive on Genghis Khan, the 1981 American Pacing Classic, 13 horse field, just a perfect drive, got away eighth, stacked up fourth and fifth over, and one just going away is probably one of my favorite calls of all time. Just uh, really a tragic waste of a, a young man's life. I wanna talk about Dave Goldschmidt just for a second. People that are here now, a lot of you probably don't realize the unsung contributions that Dave and his mother made to keep Premier Harness Racing going as far as some financial help. Dave, thank you. One of my best friends, you know, when I got goofy kind of like I am today, he would get so red either through laughing or embarrassment. He was just a good friend of mine as well as a lot of people who are here this afternoon, as well as, as, well as Eunice, the, the lady with the iron fist, literally. Um, have to talk about Alan Horowitz, one of the nicest men you would ever want to meet. Great friend of mine. I got downsized. Is that a good word for being fired? <laughs> <laughs> From TVG. And I told the lady in HR as she was handing my severance check, I said to her the gambling mode that I had, I'm going to guess her as a severance check in here. I will bet you this severance check that I have a job tomorrow. She goes, no, you won't. I said, come on, let's bet the check. It was actually the day after because I had stopped off and had, uh, as Junior Wilkinson would say, probably a couple of the adult beverages. <laughs> I had a job the next day. I called Alan, and the first thing he said was, do you need any money? And I said, no. I said, all is good. But just, I wanted to mention Alan as well. Last person I want to acknowledge has already spoken here this afternoon. What a leader you have in Christian. Taught me simulcasting 20 years ago. All of the tracks that are in existence today should follow the model of what Chris Schick has done. He has gained for you every single possible dollar in handle to help keep this fine organization going. I would love to see three and four and five days of racing back here in the state of California and under his direction and watch and wager, you are certainly headed in the right direction. Cannot thank you enough for this honor. Robin, Vicki, Fred, and Rick Keebler, 
Bobby Johnson, Steve Wiseman, heartfelt thank you very much. Robin Clements, the chair of the Hall of Fame, to present High Ho Silver Hills Award.